Okay, so this is esbism.org slash forums. And on that, Dr. Pankaj has asked a question that oxygen delivery is the function of hemoglobin. Okay, so if SpO2 is about 92%, means if the saturation is about 92% and there is no sign of hypoxia, why we need to know the PO2 levels? Means in the ABG, why we need to know the PO2 levels, which is not even responsible for oxygen delivery to the tissues? So this is a good question and I think we need to answer it and discuss a little bit in detail about it. Okay, so I will divide this question into two parts as far as I can see because there is a technical flaw in this question. So the two parts is the first part that the PO2, the, uh, the oxygen which is dissolved in the plasma doesn't take part in the oxygen delivery to the tissues. It's a function of the hemoglobin. Second part is if we know the SpO2 of the patient which is 92%, so why we need to look at the PO2 of the patient? So I'll try to answer the first part which is very very important. So here you need to understand the difference between two terms. One is the transport, the other is the delivery. I'll try to exam uh, explain you by means of an example. Suppose there is a construction site here, some building is uh, getting constructed and they require a lot of cement for that. And here is a go down where there is a lot of cement storage here and we need this cement to go from from this go down to the construction site. So obviously you people know that we'll order a truck and the truck will carry the cement from this side go down and it will take to the construction site. Now the, uh, the cement has reached the construction site and there is a truck which is full of cement. But this cement by itself cannot go inside the construction building. It needs some sort of labor for to transport to take the cement from the truck and take it to the inside. You need something. Now one will question that if if the labor is, is the person who will trans, uh, take the cement from the cons, uh, truck uh, will offload the truck and take it to the construction site. Why not order the labor for in first place to transport or bring the cement from the go down to the construction site so we'll you will say that will require a lot of amount of labor it will take too much time while the truck can transport the cement in a very fast uh, manner but here also you require the labor to uh, bring the cement from the uh, go down to the truck and from here from offloading from truck to the construction site you will require the labor so this is so the truck has only transported from point A to point B while the labor is something which has delivered the uh, cement to the construction site which is required. So, so here the go down is our lungs or alveoli. The uh, uh, truck which, which, which is used in the example is hemoglobin which is transporting from point A to point B from lungs to different parts of the body and the construction site is our uh, cell uh, cells, interstitium and cells where end user where it is needs to be transported and the cement was the oxygen. So what was this labor? This labor was the oxygen which was dissolved in the plasma which is PO2. So we'll, we'll replicate this into example. This is the lung where lot of amount of oxygen is there. It enters the alveoli and from the alveoli it diffuses into the capillaries or uh, vessels of the pulmonary vessels as soon as it enters the vessel it comes into the plasma and from plasma it is swiftly very quickly is taken by the hemoglobin and then the hemoglobin transport this to the capillary side of the cells and from cells uh, near that uh, capillary from that capillary the hemoglobin offloads it it again mixes into the plasma and then it, it diffuses into the tissues and then it uh, diffuses into the cell so hemoglobin is not delivering the oxygen hemoglobin is just transporting from point a to point b from the lungs to the different parts of the body and why dissolved plasma is not being used for that because hemoglobin transport is very quickly and also because it is using the oxygen dissociation curve it can know where to deliver more where to deliver not to more but essentially it is transporting the oxygen it is not delivering the delivery part is done by the uh, PO2 gradient, partial pressure of oxygen gradient because the partial pressure of oxygen is which it is high in the alveoli. 
and the uh, blood which is going to the lungs there is a partial pressure or oxygen uh, and this creates a gradient difference between the oxygenation in the lung and capillaries the oxygen diffuses and it travels to the blood and then in the capillaries there is a difference in the partial pressure gradient between the intravascular compartment capillaries and the interstitium and from interstitium to cell there is a difference in the partial pressure of oxygen so the oxygen is getting delivered by this oxygen which is dissolved in the plasma it is moving across the partial pressure oxygen gradient uh, we'll see a little more in it let's check in some one book so this is Guyton and Hall and let's see it chapter number 41 transport of oxygen carbon dioxide in the blood and tissue fluids so let's see here this is what I was talking about you focus here uh, this is the alveolus where the partial pressure of oxygen is 104 on room air so this is the alveoli and this is the deoxygenated blood which is coming from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillaries PO2 is 40 mm of Hg now the oxygen will move or diffuse across this pressure gradient from here to here and by the time this pulmonary capillary reaches or pul becomes pulmonary vein the partial pressure of oxygen in this is 104 so it uh, equilibrates now as soon as this PO2 enters this uh, pulmonary capillaries most of them is being captured by the hemoglobin so hemoglobin takes the uh, hemoglobin gets saturated and it uh, transport the oxygen but the remaining amount uh, remain in the plasma as undissolved form and it creates a pressure uh, gradient which is 1 to 4 the hemoglobin the oxygen which is bound to the hemoglobin doesn't create a partial pressure of oxygen in the venous blood you it, it, it doesn't exert any pressure it is bound to hemoglobin the undissolved portion of the oxygen which is there in the blood is the only thing which is uh, creating a pressure gradient and this is very necessary for movement of the uh, oxygen now you can see that if the po2 is 104 why 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 uh, we get a po2 of somewhere around 80 to 100 so you see that as soon as as soon as it uh, leaves the um, uh, uh, lung the saturated uh, po2 is 104 but what happens there is some mixture of the a blood which is not taking part in the um, gaseous action it mixes small portion mix with it and gives a saturation of somewhere uh, not saturation i'm sorry gives a po2 about 97 percent somewhere it is written 95 uh, so you see that when this blood combines in the pulmonary veins with the oxygenated blood from the alveolar capillary this so-called venous admixture of blood causes po2 of the blood entering the left heart and pumped into the aorta fall about 95 mm Hg. so the po2 which is leaving the left heart has a partial pressure of 95 mm Hg. now this po2 when reaches to the cellular level what happens this is the interstitium and in the interstitium the the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 mm Hg. so then because of it is 95 from the capillaries it it moves to the interstitium and from the interstitium it moves the cell where the at cellular level the partial pressure of oxygen is only 23 so the movement of oxygen from alveolus to pulmonary capillary to interstitium and to the cell is dependent upon the partial pressure of oxygen which is the undissolved oxygen is there in the uh, in the um, blood and it is sorry and it is responsible for movement of or you can say the delivery of oxygen to the cellular level so i hope this is clear so now coming to the second part of this question that if we know the spo2 of the patient then why we need to know the po2 of the patient suppose the spo2 is uh, 92 percent so we can uh, the approximately get an idea of po2 by rough calculation so why we need to know the po2 of the patient so for this you need to understand the oxygen dissociation curve We'll again go to back to the book, our guide and textbook of medical physiology. So this is the same chapter, but now we'll focus on the oxygen dissociation curve. Let's see here. Okay. So you see that this is the oxygen dissociation curve, oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. On this, this is the PO2 of the patient and this the hemoglobin saturation. Now, when the L, uh, suppose there is no oxygen in the human body and now the, uh, there happens a rush of oxygen in the lungs and in the alveolus and the PO2 of the alveoli starts getting uh, high and this PO2 
across the diffusion gradient uh, from LY to pulmonary capillaries starts building up in the um, pulmonary capillaries. So PO2 becomes 10, 20. Now up to 20 it is fine. Now the moment hemoglobin and uh, the moment PO2 crosses from 20 to 60 there is a steep increase in the saturation of the hemoglobin you see from it rapidly goes from up to 20 it is it was linear at 20 PO2 the saturation of hemoglobin was 20 but till the time with the PO2 reaches 60 the saturation went to 90 so this is the zygmoid sh shape of curve this is the zygmoid shape of the curve from PO2 of 20 to PO2 of 60 there is a steep rise in the saturation of hemoglobin you see the hemoglobin saturation and when the PO2 reaches from 60 to 100 the rise in the saturation is not so much it only rise from 90 to 100 so this is this is the a plateau phase of the oxygen dissociation curve. So in the earlier phase, it was a linear from PO to 20 to saturation 20. From 20 to 60, it was a steep curve. And then from 60 PO2 to 100, there is a uh, there is a plateau phase of the saturation. Now this is important. Now this gives you a buffer in the body. This gives you a buffer in the body. This is a beautiful mechanism which is made in the human body. Suppose somebody goes, a normal person goes to the hill area and where the PO2 falls. Still the oxygen, jo oxygen is, uh, hemoglobin is saturated, it will not fall. But if the PO2 reaches 60, there is a steep fall in the saturation. Now in the critical patient, you never know what is the buffer in the patient body whether at the SPO2 of, nine, uh, SPO2 of 92 saturation, whether your PO2 is uh, 90, 80 or 60. Suppose the PO2 is 70, this patient is high risk of deteriorating very fast. That's why at baseline we need to understand that what is the PO2 of the patient and what is the SPO2 of this patient. There are other three or four factors, let's discuss them. So one of the reason why we need to know the PO2 and the SPO2 is we need to know what is the correlation between PO2 and SPO2 in our critical patient. We never know what is the actual correlation between them. Obviously, we can assume that for 1 mm fall in saturation, PO2 must have dropped by 4 mm up to 90%. But this is a rough calculation on normal patient. We don't know what is going on in our critical patient. Secondly, PO2 at 92% can be 80, can be 70, can be 60, depending upon the physiology of the patient. So we need to know the alveolar arterial gradient. For that, we need to know the PO2 and PO2 in the blood also. So by that, we need to understand whether the lung is improving or not improving, whether there is a problem with the lung or not the lung. Thirdly, you need to understand that the SPO2 is a calculated value, while PO2 is a measured value. So calculated value is always not so reliable while measured value is much better reliable than the calculated value fourthly there are certain conditions like methemoglobinemia and the carboxyhemoglobin in carbon monoxide poisoning where there is a discrepancy between the methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin because of that there is a discrepancy between the spo2 and the pao2 so SPO2 can be falsely high, SPO2 can be falsely low. So if you want to understand what is the mechanism in methemoglobinemia or carboxyhemoglobinemia, what is the correlation, you can post in the comment. I'll try to explain it in detail. And in some other condition like in hyperperfused state, because the SPO2 uh, measures the pulsatile flow uh, saturations only, because the perfusion is low, at times it gives an error. It is not reliable when the perfusion states are low. You need to depend it upon the um, capillary PO2. In such conditions also, the SPO2 is not reflecting the actual amount of oxygen which is there at the microvascular level near in the capillaries, uh, in the uh, blood capillary. So you need to rely on the PO2 in the blood. So these are uh, certain facts or my understanding of why PO2 important and why hemoglobin is only transporting the oxygen while PO2 is the, the gradient which is delivering the oxygen to the tissues. So I had tried to explain in a little bit of um, detail with my understanding. If you still have doubt, you can ask in the comments. If you have more suggestions, if you find anything else, you can post in the comments. And just as a uh, clarification that I have been asked many times that whether I see the comments or the questions asked by the members on the channel. 
so whether i personally read them so on the youtube the icu channel and also on the esbsm forums i go through 99% of time all the comments some of them i try to immediately text and reply it uh, for some i make icu shorts and some questions are there for which i need a little bit of reading or i need a little bit of detailed video to explain so i take time i note it down but i make sure that at some point of time they are answered on instagram and the telegram and uh, on the twitter and other uh, platforms my team goes through mm, those comments and occasionally also go through them and they get me updated about certain comments which they feel should be answered so this is a general uh, uh, general working of mine for the comments and ic uh, on the channel so thanks for asking thanks for getting engaged in the comment section and i'm really happy these days that members are explaining to each other in the comment somebody asks the other replies based on the previous shorts on or the learning at times if there is a slip of tongue of mine they also tries to correct that and explain that so i'm very thankful to all of you and i i really don't I'm a big fan of PPTs because the point is I'm very weak in making PPTs and it at times feel monotonous to me. So that's why I use books. I use talkative videos. I talk a lot. So I try to explain in without PPTs. So if you feel that this is fine, that's okay. If you feel you need a PPT, then somebody needs to teach me how to make good PPTs. You can help me out. Thank you and see you in the next video.